Empires rise and fall like a loaf of bread in the oven. But like a bad baker, some empires get burnt and turned to ash. Only a few dead empires have a reputation that stand the test of time. We've all heard of the ancient Greeks and Roman Empire, but what about the unlucky ones who are barely a footnote in a history textbook? Well, they've got stories behind them too. So in honor of the civilizations that have faded from most people's memories, we're going to examine what made them so great and how they finally collapsed. So it's time to learn how history works as we remember the biggest empires you've probably never heard of. The Khmer Empire. Another empire that spanned just over 600 years was the Khmer Empire, aka the Angkor Empire. Its formation was similar to the Ottoman project because it got a jumpstart with the unification of principalities. It started in what is now modern-day Cambodia, after centuries of forming and dissolving unities between city-states. Eventually, after generations of infighting and pirate looting, one man would step forward to unite the proto-empires with a steady hand, Jayaraman II, the God King. His empire's position slap bang in the middle of the maritime trade route of India and Southeast Asia would prove to be useful, not just as an exchange of goods, but also cultures and ideas, hence the spread of Buddhism and Hinduism across both lands. Perhaps you've heard of Angkor Wat. It's the biggest religious structure in the world, created as a dedication to the god Vishnu of the Khmer Empire, although it was gradually transformed into a Buddhist temple at the end of the 12th century. For the Khmer Empire, Hinduism formed the way of life, with social systems having a heavy bearing on the Hindu caste system. Whatever your social status, it was immutable. This way of life spread with each of Jayaraman's successors as the empire rebelled foreign invaders from the ocean whilst also making gains inland by moving north. They also maintained enemies too. The Srivijaya Empire was expanded, so to get one up on their rivals, the Khmers allied with the enemy's commercial competitor, the Trola dynasty of southern India. Following the Srivijaya's decline, Khmer swooped in to secure their placement on the political and commercial ladder. This is even more impressive when you consider how, from day one, the empire was plagued with infighting, rebellions, and place intrigue. A fair share of these were successful too, yet the empire was well run with a big population and prosperous land. At one point, it boasted seven grand capital cities, each with an even grander temple, but the real ingenuity can be measured in the series of intricate canals that aided travel and irrigation, effectively making all of these cities one big metropolitan zone of one million inhabitants. By the time the empire hit its golden age, it was building hospitals and bribing Mongol invaders to turn around and go. But cracks couldn't be paved over forever. The empire had slowly been fragmenting. Cities had been overthrown and separate states had been formed, and even former territories were given independence. Attempts to unify the former factions failed, and the weakened Khmer lost the north to the Thais who had struck after usurping a neighbor. Further attempts were made to buffer a Thai invasion, but it was in vain. The writing was on the wall. The empire withered and died in 1431, with no surviving historical records in its final period, though historians believe that bad soil and floods paved a big role in finishing off the empire. Interestingly, the last king of Khmer took a band of refugees south to make a new capital city, Cambodia. Somehow, this new city and monarchy managed to fend off invaders and grow into eventually becoming the Cambodia of the modern age. That makes it the only empire on this list which still exists in some small part today. The Babylonians. Chances are you've heard of these guys, as they appear in the Bible, though not favorably. But did you know that their city gates were a wonder of the world of ancient times? Dubbed Gates of the Gods, Babylon was located in what is now modern-day Iraq, but its most famous contribution as a city of culture was its hanging gardens, although the ruins have never been found. In fact, most ruins were lost as the water level of lush Mesopotamia rose dramatically over the centuries. This means that the ruins we have discovered were built almost a thousand years after the city was first founded. Although so little is known of its early days, historians do know that its most famous king was Hammurabi, as it was his reign that transformed the city into the most powerful in the region. His law code centralized his government, so we're ahead of its time. It helped him to maintain rule when Babylon increased in size and influence. Common laws and legal rights kept his subjects happy, and his increased public works, like temples and walls, proved to them that this king was invested in the longevity of his kingdom. However, when he died, so did stability. The city was captured by different groups, including the Kassites in 13th century BC, who renamed the city. One of their kings, Sunakrib, was revolted against by the Babylonians. In response, he razed the city and scattered the ruins. Many of his colleagues thought this was a bit extreme, so they killed him, rebuilt the city, and restored the name. And you thought your office dynamic was bad. 
Yet despite being the biggest and most advanced city in the world at the time, and one with such a long lifespan, the city-state eventually fell. Civil unrest with the late Neo-Babylonian rulers paved way for the Achaemenids empire to invade. The people flocked to their new ruler, and just like that, the city that was ahead of its time got kicked to the curb. The Achaemenid Empire was started as a conglomerate of nomadic Persians ended in a short-lived but dominating empire that spread as far as the Balkans in the west to the Indus Valley in the east. That's a whopping 5.5 million square kilometers under their domain, but the reputation was more than one of robust expansion. It started in 552 BC, when Cyrus returned to his homeland of Persis to raise a revolt. This created a domino effect that sent the Median Empire crashing down. Cyrus had proved himself on the battlefield, and gradually parts of Median swore alliance to him, thereby granting him access to the infrastructure of a powerful state. No doubt learning from his enemy's mistake, he divided territories into semi-autonomous provinces with appointed overseers. The successful government model included roads, bureaucratic administration, complex building infrastructure, and even a postal system. But Cyrus's most unique contribution to history was his hand-picked spear-wielding warriors called the Immortals. They were the best of the best, and the ranks never went below 10,000. As you can imagine, this mighty army would butt heads with the city-states of ancient Greek while slowly turning favor with neighbors, yet it remained strong. In fact, all the changing leaders of the empire were able to keep things running more or less smoothly over the next hundred years or so, but that reputation would end up being their downfall. Their success grew much admiration, especially from Alexander the Great, who held their founding leader, the invader of Babylon himself, Cyrus the Great, in high regard so much so that he invaded the empire and wiped them out in just a few short years. The Byzantine Empire People tend to agree that the ancient Roman Empire collapsed in the 5th century, but not many know that an offshoot continued to evolve right into the Middle Ages. That's exactly what happened with the Byzantines. Constantine was the first Christian emperor and moved the capital of the empire to Constantinople, founded on the site of the ancient Greek city of, you guessed it, Byzantium. From this seat, east of sacked Rome, a succession of emperors ruled for 11 long centuries, with the culture continuing to develop Rome's tradition of art, literature, and even fashion. That means they were wearing togas and centurion garb, whilst the toiling peasants of medieval Europe were wearing rags of cloth. Sharing a foundation with the Roman Empire also gave them an artistic and technological advantage over their barbaric neighbors. They devised a series of beacons that could warn the emperors of an invading army within an hour, and they even used hydraulic ingenuity and other cutting-edge tech in their decorations, including being able to raise the emperor's throne with a lever. There are even eyewitness reports of tourists seeing mechanized lion statues guarding the throne room. But they also innovated. Artists created vast mosaics in ornate marble carvings, and architects constructed numerous churches. A lot of this history was recorded by Princess Anna Comnini of the 12th century. Her intimate and lengthy detailing of her father's inner court are some of the most rare historical eyewitness accounts of a bygone civilization. But all of these advances in heritage wouldn't be able to protect them forever. A few revolts and rampaging crusaders weakened the empire until 1453, when Ottoman Emperor Mehmed the Conqueror seized the city, thus conclusively ending the Roman Empire once and for all. However, the Byzantines never called their empire Byzantine. They considered themselves to be Roman, with some descendants calling themselves as such until the 21st century. It was only when the Renaissance became infatuated with the wisdom of the ancients that a line was drawn between Europeans who had never lost touch with antiquity. Or to put it another way, they wanted to make a distinction between the classical pagan, Latin-speaking Roman Empire of the old and the medieval, Christian-Greek-speaking Empire of the new. So, when historians needed a name, they turned to the city it was founded on, and that's how the Byzantine Empire was born a hundred years after it died. The Ottomans In the 13th century, before Turkey was Turkey, Osman I established a small principality. At the time, it was one of many principalities in the area, sandwiched between a crumbling Byzantine Empire and a weakened Sultanate. But change was in the air, and Osman's group seized this golden opportunity through a mixture of strategic political alliances and military conflicts. This winning streak attracted mercenaries, which sped up his expansion, which in turn brought more wealth. In fact, one edge the Ottomans had was to prioritize political and military unity over the tribal loyalties of ethnic and religious lines. He fought with people when he needed to, and fought against them when the time was right. Basically, he played them like Walter White played Jesse. In just a few generations, this group would outgrow and outmaneuver its neighbors to become the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans implemented a military organization and tax collection system that would favor rapid territorial expansion, with their first major one being the Balkans. 
Here, they captured young Christian boys from the Byzantine Empire, converted them to Islam, and trained them to be the backbone of their elite forces. But it was the capture of Constantinople, later renamed Istanbul, that saw rapid economic growth thanks to the exporting of coffee to Europe and the importing of craftsmen from Europe, Africa, and even Asia and the Middle East. Clearly, they had learned a lot about how to network and bring people together in their years of political 4D chess. For 600 years, the empire's trade routes were secure, but the first sign of the end came with the losing of the Balkan War in 1912. The Ottomans had to give up territory and influence. This put them on the back foot and was part of why they joined Germany in World War I, but being on the losing side of the Great War brought their empire to a sudden halt. All territories of the Central Powers were divided amongst the victors, and then finally, in 1992, the Ottoman title of Sultan was wiped away so that the Republic of Turkey could be born. While you may have never heard of these empires, I'm sure you've never heard of the 10 worst popes. Is that because the Catholic Church intentionally hides that? Well, you should go and find out for yourself. Go and watch our video on the 10 worst popes of all time. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe to keep on learning how history works.